I'm looking through the keyhole. As you can see, tonight is all about keys in literature. We're talking about the key to it all. What is the key and how do we find it? Uh, thanks for joining me. Great to see you. I am a bit obsessed with keys right now because I'm doing, in my art group this term, we're talking about secret gardens. And one of the themes that I've done is the key to the secret garden. Look at this beautiful key. This really could be the key to the secret garden. I've always found keys very exciting. And I have kept in a hoarder-like fashion many keys to places that I used to live that I probably should have given back. But I just can't help but hold on to keys. I've still got the keys to the School of Life shop, which doesn't exist anymore, which is rather tragic, uh, in Marchmont Street. So... I started thinking about keys in literature because of this amazing key in The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. And do go and have a look at my Ella Bertu paintings uh, Instagram page because on there I put the rather fabulous depictions of The Secret Garden through the keyhole. Um, they've been doing paintings looking through the keyhole and also they've done the door to the secret garden and they've also done uh, the key itself this week. So Sandra it's lovely to see you here this evening and Helen and Mel. Great to see you all um, and I know that some of you have some amazing secret gardens yourselves. Anyway we will come to The Secret Garden in a minute, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about the history of keys because it's actually rather fascinating when you start exploring where keys came from and what they were like in the olden days. So apparently the story of keys began when the first locks appeared back in ancient Babylon and Egypt 6,000 years ago. By using wooden toothbrush shaped keys, the Egyptians could lift the small pins in the lock and unlock the bolt. So the keys in those days were just like a kind of almost like a snaky thing, um, a bit like we might use to pick a lock. Apparently, um, these simple wooden devices used small pins, which were hidden in a small opening near the bolt. And by using an instrument that they say looked a bit like a toothbrush, they could be opened. But this design was not that brilliant because both lock and key were made of wood, which could be very easily um, forced and could deteriorate very quickly. So they started fairly rapidly trying to make them out of metal instead. But the oldest examples of these ancient locks were found in the ruins of the Assyrian palace of Khorasabad in the biblical city of Nineveh. And these lock mechanisms were dated to 704 BC. So we have been using keys and locks for a good 2,000 years. And I bet there's some people out there who know much more about archaeology than I do. But it's rather fascinating to see what keys used to look like. Then the next evolution of keys came in ancient Rome when engineers and inventors managed to greatly improve on the designs of the Egyptian wooden, wooden locks by using iron and bronze. Romans were able to create much stronger and smaller locks. So apparently in those first days, the locks were absolutely massive. They were about that big and people used to wear their keys on their shoulders as a bit of a status symbol and they would have actually been enormous which is quite a weird thought but gradually as keys evolved they cleverly made some keys that could actually be worn on a ring and it apparently became quite a common thing this is not a, a key ring um a ring key it, it became quite a common thing for women to have a little key attached to their ring 
with which they could open their jewellery boxes, which is a pretty groovy idea. I'd like to bring that back. I think we should all have little keys on our rings. So by using iron and bronze, Romans made much stronger and smaller locks and they then had keys that could be carried about their person much more easily. So um, they started calling them what we would call today a skeleton key, which was a simple cylindrical shaft that has one single thin and rectangular tooth, which would be a bit like that, I guess. This design continued to be used for 17 centuries after the fall of the Roman Empire, receiving only minor updates in their looks during all that time and making, making their efforts mostly about defending off thieves. And so they basically didn't change the design because it was quite a good design. But modern flat keys like these were first introduced to the public by Linus Yale. That's where you get the old Yale lock from. I didn't know that. So Linus Yale was the first person to introduce these modern flat keys. And that was in the mid 1800s. By using tumbler locks and more sophisticated ways of regulating the pins, these flat keys became an instant success across the entire world. They were easy to manufacture and thanks to the invention of key cutting, they became very popular and easy to replicate. So tonight we're going to be looking through the keyhole at keys in books and um, I will just be telling you a little bit more about the history of keys before I get on to that. So some keys that were made in Roman times also reflected the architecture of the day and they were made not only to fit the lock but also to look like the door that the lock was um, going to go into. So people have been very inventive with their keys over the years and I've only got slightly unexciting keys to show you this evening. If anyone's got any cool, amazing keys, I'd love to see them. Send me a photo. Um, so locks in fairy tales and poetry have been very common since earliest times. Consider the tales from the Thousand and One Nights. In the story of Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, the portal to the treasure chamber was opened with the code words, open sesame. That is a kind of key in the form of a word. In Swedish folk tales, we have the castle that stood on golden posts. A cat transformed itself into a loaf of bread in the keyhole of a giant's castle, keeping the giant from getting into his home. Unlock the door, the giant yelled, but instead the cat told him about its many adventures until the sun went up and the giant burst. Interesting. Um, so that's from a Swedish fairy tale. But there are lots of keys that are important in fairy tales. There's another strange fairy tale story from Grimm's fairy tales called The Golden Key, which um, was in place 200 in the Grimm's fairy tale edition. It was always ca came at the very end of all of the Grimm's fairy tales because it's quite a brief and bizarre story. It's basically uh, about two chickens who find a little key and a little box in the dung. The box contains a short piece of fur made of red silk. And they say, if it had been longer, the fairy tale would have become longer too. And some people say that the key, um, that it was a boy, not two chickens, that found the key in the dung. Anyway, very strange little short story. But there's going to be more keys in stories coming along, coming along. But the first one that I really want to tell you about is the key to the secret garden, which could be a key very like this one. And that's what got me started on this whole topic. 
The Key to the Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. If anyone hasn't read that yet, go and read it immediately. It won't take you very long. It's a fairly short book, only about 150 pages, and it's very beautiful and very full of hope and optimism. But it does start off with a very disagreeable little girl called Mary, whose whole family have died of cholera in India, which is where the story starts. So um, the story begins with her wondering what the heck is going on as all her family die around her. And then she gets sent to a very unhospitable place in Yorkshire, where she's sent to live with her uncle. And it seems incredibly boring and sad and lonely, but um, she gradually begins to explore outside and she becomes obsessed with this idea that there's a secret garden in the grounds and she's obsessed with trying to get into the secret garden and she gets help from a little bird. So I'm just going to read you a little bit from the secret garden so that you understand how lovely it is. She heard a chirp and a twitter and when she looked at the bare flower bed at her left side there he was, the little robin, hopping about and pretending to peck things out of the earth to persuade her that he had not followed her. But she knew he had followed her, and the surprise so filled her with delight that she almost trembled a little. You do remember me, she cried out. You do. You are prettier than anything else in the world. She chirped and talked and coaxed, and he hopped and flirted his tail and twittered. It was as if he were talking. His red waistcoat was like satin and he puffed his tiny breast out and was so fine and so grand and so pretty that it was really as if he were showing her how important and how like a human person a robin could be. Mistress Mary forgot that she had ever been contrary in her life when he allowed her to draw closer and closer to him and bend down and talk and try to make something like robin sounds. Oh, to think that he should actually let her come as near to him as that. She's a very lonely girl. Don't forget Mary Lennox, suddenly really hot, trying to wear this beautiful coat because it felt like the coat of someone who keeps keys. This is the coat of a magnificent key keeper, but it's too hot to wear. So I'm going to have to strip. But let's get back to Mary Lennox, the disagreeable child, who is now suddenly not quite so disagreeable because she's fallen in love, in love with a robin. She put out her hand towards him. He knew, he knew it because he was a real person, only nicer than any other person in the world, talking about the bird here. She was so happy that she scarcely dared to breathe. The flower bed was not quite bare. It was bare of flowers because the perennial plants had been cut down for their winter rest. But there were tall shrubs and low ones which grew together at the back of the bed. And as the robin hopped about under them, she saw him hop over a small pile of freshly turned up earth. He stopped on it to look for a worm. The earth had been turned up because a dog had been trying to dig up a mole and he had scratched quite a deep hole. Mary looked at it, not really knowing why the hole was there. And as she looked, she saw something almost buried in the newly turned soil. It was something like a ring of rusty iron or brass. And when the robin flew up into a tree nearby, she put out her hand and picked the ring up. It was more than a ring, however. It was an old key, which looked as if it had been buried a long time. Mistress Mary looked up and looked at it with an almost frightened face as it hung from her finger. Perhaps it has been buried for ten years, she said in a whisper. Perhaps it is the key to the garden. She looked at the key for quite a long time. Now, people that know the story will know that Mary does find her way into the secret garden and... She manages to look through the keyhole and then actually get in to the secret garden. And I'll just read you the little moment when she does get in. And again, the robin, the bird, 
helps her to get in. And this book, The Secret Garden, is all about nature helping someone to get over their loneliness and melancholy. And it is a very beautiful story because of that exact reason. So I'll just read you this little bit where she does get into the garden because it is really lovely. You showed me where the key was yesterday, she said. You ought to show me the door today, but I don't believe you know. She doesn't know where the door to the secret garden is. Obviously, the robin can understand everything she says. The robin flew from his swinging spray of ivy onto the top of the wall and he opened his beak and sang a loud, lovely trill, merely to show off. Nothing in the world is quite as adorably lovely as a robin when he shows off, and they are nearly always doing it. Mary Lennox had heard a great deal about magic in her Ayers stories, and she always said that what happened at, at that moment was magic. One of the nice little gusts of wind rushed down the walk, and it was a stronger one than the rest. It was strong enough to wave the branches of the trees, and it was more than strong enough to sway the trailing sprays of untrimmed ivy hanging from the wall. Mary had stepped close to the robin and suddenly the gust of wind swung aside some loose ivy trails and more suddenly still, she jumped towards it and caught it in her hand. This she did because she'd seen something under it, a round knob which had been covered by the leaves hanging over it. It was the knob of a door. She put her hands under the leaves and began to pull and push them aside. Thick as the ivy hung, it nearly all was a loose and swinging curtain, though some had crept over wood and iron. Mary's heart began to thump and her hands to shake a little. In her delight and excitement, the robin kept singing and twittering away and tilting his head on one side, as if he were as excited as she was. What was this under her hands, which was square and made of iron and which her fingers found a hole in? Maybe she had found the keyhole. I think she had. It was the lock of the door which had been closed ten years and she put her hand in her pocket, drew out the key and found that it fitted the keyhole. She put the key in and turned it. It took two hands to do it, but it did turn. So maybe it's a slightly bigger key than this. And then she took a long breath and looked behind her up the long walk to see if anyone was coming. No one was coming. No one ever did come, it seemed, and she took another long breath because she could not help it, and she held back the swinging curtain of ivy and pushed back the door, which opened slowly, slowly. Then she slipped through it and shut it behind her and stood with her back against it, looking about her and breathing quite fast with excitement and wonder and delight. She was standing inside the secret garden. So that is the secret garden which is the story which set about this whole idea of keys in literature but I'm going to tell you a few other keys in stories um, before going into such depth with more stories. Any, anyone joining now who hasn't yet read The Secret Garden You've got to read it. It's one of the best books ever. I read it as a child, but it's a great book to read at any age. Brilliant for all ages. Another great children's book, um, with, which is, has a very important key in it, is The Indian in the Cupboard, which is a very lovely book, which I was trying to find this evening and annoyingly couldn't get my hands on it. It's by Lynn Reed Banks. And it is a really fun, interesting read. And in that one, there's a very bored, lonely boy in the summer holidays. It's a classic story. And he discovers that in his room, he has a cupboard, which when he turns the key, the toys within the cupboard come to life. And he then plays with his toys that literally come to life. So that is a really fun, interesting story. Um, there's also, of course, the key in Alice in Wonderland. Uh, there's a very important key which is spotted right at the beginning of the story when Alice follows the white rabbit down the rabbit hole. She falls into a tiny room which is locked by a teeny tiny door. She never actually manages to use the key to get through the tiny door. Instead, 
she cries a river of tears and surfs her way out of the room, which is quite a fantastic image in itself. So the key is unnecessary, but um, it is nonetheless there in the story. And that would be a key that I would imagine most likely looks like the one I was showing you earlier. That's my best key. All my other keys are frankly a bit boring, but you can see that I do love to hoard keys. I think I always think that I'm going to be able to use a key again sometime. And I'm sure that one of the keys I've got in here is the key to the swimming pool at Queenswood School, where I used to go swimming in the middle of the night. And I wasn't meant to have that key. If anyone out there is listening from Queenswood School staff, I could give you the key back one day. But actually, I do know that that swimming pool, tragically, where I used to go swimming in the middle of the night illegally when I was artist in residence there, it has now been turned into a library. It's literally a swimming pool library. And it is a really beautiful building. And I bet my key doesn't fit that door anymore. But Queensborough School is where I, I went to school and I did lots of amazing reading there when I was a teenager. And I also went back there as artist in residence. And when I was there, I lived above the library. And so that was very appropriate as I've always been obsessed with books. I was mostly painting then and I used to go swimming in the middle of the night. Um, by having acquired a key to that <laughs> swimming pool. Anyway, um, another book that I would have been reading in my Queenswood days would have been The Hobbit. And in The Hobbit, we have the key to Erebor, which is um, the key entrusted to Thorin by Gandalf. And it's eventually used to open the secret door to the Lonely Mountain. Imagine if he'd lost that key, the horror. I bet how many of you out there listening are regular losers of keys. Um, I am, I am constantly losing my keys. And by the way, I am gonna come in a little bit to some bibliotherapy for when you've been locked out of your house, because I think that's a very important aspect of bibliotherapy when you've lost your keys. But first I want to just talk a little bit more about keys and books. So Harry Potter, by the way, um, has a lot of interesting use of keys in the Philosopher's Stone. For instance, there's a flock of winged keys. And one of my art students this week, rather marvellously, created a whole flock of winged keys in her painting that she did using collage and acrylic paint. You can have a look at it on my Ella Bear 2 paintings Instagram. And she said that was not inspired by Harry Potter. But in Harry Potter, there is uh, one of the protections for the Philosopher's Stone put in place by the Professor of Charms, Phileas Flitwick. He creates a swarm of winged keys, which fills a well-lit chamber, blocking the way to the hiding place of the mirror of Erised and the Philosopher's Stone within. The keys had shiny, brightly coloured wings, which glittered like jewels. One particular key, an old fashioned silver key with bright blue wings was needed to open the heavy wooden door leading to the next chamber. Flying keys, flying keys. These are the flying keys of Harry Potter, but they had beautiful wings, unlike the ones that I've got. Maybe we should paint some winged keys. I think that's a good idea. Um, and in order to pass through that door, a person had to mount a broomstick and fly to catch the right key by which they could then get through. Um, Colleen, you're saying that you saw the movie before you read the book. Which movie are you talking about? Um, is it The Indian in the Cupboard? I wonder. Completely different, you say. Um, and by the way, if anyone has any other thoughts about keys in books, do let me know, because I know that there's going to be lots that I haven't thought about. So 
keys in Harry Potter. There's the room full of winged keys, which are protecting the Philosopher's Stone as part of the puzzle that Harry, Hermione and Ron have to get through in order to get to the Philosopher's Stone. Also, um, in generally in the Harry Potter books, J.K. Rowling invented the idea of port keys, which are not literal keys, but they are a key to travelling. And they are a rather fabulous invention, I must say. Almost any inanimate object can be turned into a port key. Once bewitched, the object will transport anyone who grasps it to a pre-arranged destination. A port key may also be enchanted to transport the grasper or graspers only at a given time. In this way, the arrivals and departures of great numbers of witches and wizards can be staggered, enabling such events as the Quidditch World Cup to take place with few security breaches. So port keys are really very key in Harry Potter and they are a rather wonderful invention by which J.K. Rowling manages to have a lot of quite amazing, important and drastic plot developments, which I won't go into in case any of our, uh, anyone out there hasn't read the books or seen the films. But the porkies are great. One of them is an old boot. You have to touch an old boot. And then when you touch it, you get immediately transported to um, the place where the uh, where the Quidditch World Cup is being held and you have some rather dramatic and quite violent movements because of the port keys in Harry Potter uh, and there's, it, it takes some very dark turns with Voldemort which I won't go into but it's all pretty dramatic and exciting. Another very important key in literature is the fleur-de-lis bank key in the Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. Now, I wonder if any of you are readers of Dan Brown. Um, oh, I've just got a reply from Colleen. It was The Secret Garden, thanks for telling me that, um, which was the one where Colleen saw the film first and then read the book. Um, and I wonder which you preferred. Let me know, because obviously I think the book is much better, but you may beg to differ. So The Da Vinci Code, I bet a lot of you have read it. That is a book which very memorably my husband and I read aloud to each other um, on our way down from the Lake District back home to Sussex many years ago. And I have to say it was a great read aloud book. It is a book that you can quite a lot take the mickey out of as you go along because of the dialogue, the opportunity for accents, and the sometimes somewhat absurd um, use of language and plot developments. But it is a really fun and exciting read. And in this uh, book, there's a very important key, which is the fancy fleur-de-lis bank key, which uh, is a very beautiful and highly complex creation. But it's also opening an extremely high-tech safe. Unlocking the safe leads cryptologist Sophie Nouveau and Dr Robert Langdon, who is the hero of the story, to multiple clues, including the mega cool Cryptex. The Cryptex ultimately leads them to the largest fictional cover-up in history. And the Cryptex is a kind of really strange and cool, amazing um, kind of key that was invented by Leonardo da Vinci. So I think the cryptex would have been a real thing, but obviously in the da Vinci Code, it's a fictional version of it. So uh, that's a few pretty exciting keys from fiction. And I'd love to know if you have any of your own important and brilliant keys in fiction. But I do want to mention another excellent uh, key in fiction, which is from a story by H.P. Lovecraft, which is called The Secret Key. 
Um, and I was trying to find um, my HP Lovecraft book, which has also strangely gone on a walk, which is maybe not surprising for HP Lovecraft because he did create such mysterious and frankly often quite terrifying stories. So I just want to tell you about this story, The Secret Key by H.P. Lovecraft, which is not a long story. You can read it on Project Gutenberg, by the way, for free. Probably will only take you about half an hour to read. So the story is about Randolph Carter, who when he's 30 years old, he loses the key to the gate of dreams. So he's always had this ability to go through a gate of dreams and explore what lies beyond. So before he loses the key to the gate of dreams, he had made up for the prosiness of life by nightly excursions to strange and ancient cities beyond space and lovely, unbelievable garden lands across ethereal seas. But as middle age, I wouldn't call 30 middle age, by the way, hardened upon him. He felt these liberties slipping away little by little until at last he was cut off altogether. So it's rather a fabulous idea in H.P. Lovecraft, The Secret Key, that he has lost the key to his dreams as he's got older, as he's got used to um, hanging out with boring grown-ups. I'm just trying to find the bit... Uh, in my notes where I can read you a section from H.P. Lovecraft um, and I think it's here. Here we go. He had read too much of things as they are and talked with too many people. Well-meaning philosophers had taught him to look into the logical relations of things and analyse the processes which shaped his thoughts and fancies. Wonder had gone away and he had forgotten that all life is only a set of pictures in the brain, among which there is no difference betwixt those born of real things and those born of inward dreamings, and no cause to value the one above the other. Custom had dim, dinned into his ears a superstitious reverence for that which tangibly and physically exists, and had made him secretly ashamed to dwell in visions. Wise men, told him his simple fancies were inane and childish, and he believed it because he could see that they might easily be so. What he failed to recall was that the deeds of reality are just as inane and childish, and even more absurd because their actors persist in fancying them full of meaning and purpose as the blind purpose grinds aimlessly on from nothing to something, back to nothing again neither heeding nor knowing the wishes or existence of the minds that flicker for a second now and then in the darkness. They had chained him down to things that are and had then explained the workings and those things till mystery had gone out of the world. When he complained and longed to escape into twilight realms where magic moulded all the little vivid fragments and prized associations of his mind into vistas of breathless expectancy and unquenchable delight, they turned him instead towards the newfound prodigies of science, bidding him find wonder in the atom's vortex and the mystery in the sky's dimensions. And when he had failed to find these boons in things whose laws are known and measurable, they told him he lacked imagination and was immature because he preferred dream illusions to the illusions of our physical creation. So Carter tried to do as others did and pretended that the common events and emotions of earthly minds were more important than the fantasies of rare and delicate souls. So this is a great story, folks. I think everyone should read it. Randolph Carter, age 30, um, in this story, The Secret Key by H.P. Lovecraft, is about a man who has lost the key to his dreams. He, when he goes to sleep, he used to be able to unlock the key, the door to fantasy and imagination. And now he can't do it anymore. He's lost the key to his dreams. And he has actually given up even on attempting to get back through that door in his dreams. But once in a while, he couldn't help seeing how shallow, fickle and meaningless 
all human aspirations are and how emptily our real impulses contrast with those pompous ideals we profess to hold. Then he would have recourse to the polite laughter they taught him to use against the extravagance and artificiality of dreams. For he saw that the daily life of our world is every inch as extravagant and artificial and far less worthy of respect because of its poverty and beauty and its silly reluctance to admit its own lack of reason and purpose. In this way, he became a kind of humorist, for he didn't see that even humour is empty in a mindless universe, devoid of any true standard of consistency or inconsistency. So this is H.P. Lovecraft's story, The Secret Key, where poor old Carter has lost the key to his dreams. But it ends really well. And I don't think it's going to give away too much if I do give away a bit of the ending. People who don't want to know the ending, maybe go and make a quick cup of tea at this moment. I'm going to read you the last two paragraphs. It does leave it on a mystery, but it is possibly clear what's happened. I will tell you this little bit, um, but I think it's a really good ending. Carter's relatives talk much of these things because he has lately disappeared. His little old servant, Parks, who for years bore patiently with his vagaries, last saw him on the morning he drove off alone in his car with a key that he had recently found. Parks had helped him get the key from the old box containing it and had felt strangely affected by the grotesque carvings in the box. Maybe it was a box a bit like that. Um, where am I? I've lost it now. And by some other odd quality he could not name, when Carter left, he'd said he was going to visit his old ancestral country around Arkham, which has been mentioned previously as a place he used to go in his dreams, by the way. Halfway up Elm Mountain, on the way to the ruins of the old Carter place, they found his motor set carefully by the roadside, roadside and in it was a box of fragrant wood with carvings that frightened the countrymen who stumbled upon it. The box held only a queer parchment whose characters no linguist or paleographer has been able to decipher or identify. Rain had long effaced any possible footprints, though Boston investigators had something to say about evidences of disturbances along the fallen timbers of the Carter place. It was, they averred, as though someone had groped about the ruins at no distant period. A common white handkerchief found among the forest rocks on the hillside beyond cannot be identified as belonging to the missing man. This is not a common white handkerchief, but it's definitely a magical kind of uh, handkerchief, the like of which would be in an H.P. Lovecraft story. Um, these are handkerchiefs that have come from my parents house and they're definitely quite magical and full of dreams. Uh, there is talk of apportioning Randolph Carter's estate among his heirs but I shall stand firmly against this course because I do not believe he is dead. There are twists of time and space of vision and reality which only a dreamer can divine and from what I know of Carter I think he's merely found a way to traverse these mazes. Whether or not he will ever come back, I cannot say. He wanted the lands of dreams he had lost and yearned for the days of his childhood. Then he found a key, and I somehow believe he was able to use it to his advantage. So we all need to hold on to that key, the key to your dreams and to your subconscious. It actually very much reminds me of another short story which is by H.G. Wells called The Green Door, which is similarly about a door through to imagination. And that's another really fantastic kind of novella or long short story, which I would highly recommend. Um, another novel, which is called The Key, is by Junikiro Tanizaki, a Japanese novel which is all about the key to a diary and it's written entirely in diary extracts by a husband and wife and 
the fun of this book, which is well known as an early erotic novel, is about, uh, it, the fun of it is that the husband and the wife are writing their diary entries and locking their diaries, but leaving the keys to their diaries in a quite obvious place, deliberately knowing that their spouse will find the key, open the diary and read it, and therefore get more of a clue to what they really want when it comes to being fulfilled. So I'll just read you a little bit from a diary entry. This year I intend to begin writing freely about a topic which in the past I have hesitated even to mention here. I've always avoided commenting on my sexual relations with Ikuku for fear that she might surreptitiously read my diary and be offended. I dare say she knows exactly where to find it, but I have decided not to worry about that anymore. Of course, her old-fashioned Kyoto upbringing has left her with a good deal of antiquated morality. Indeed, she would dip into her private, her husband's private writings. Um, by the way, this is obviously written in translation because it's a Japanese novel and the translator is Howard Hibbert. Um, so the book has two narrative parts, both in the form of the diary. It's an older husband who I think is about 20 years older than his much younger wife, Ikuku, who he's very much in love with, but is deeply worried about his desires for her. Then we see the other side of the story as Ikuku tries to help and follows her husband's desires as she tries to stop letting him know that she knows what he's up to. So she uh, is reading his diary, but trying to not let him realise that she is reading his diary. So they're playing rather a lovely game together in a way. I'll just read you a little bit from her diary. I suppose he carried me here from the bath that night, put me to bed and then, since I was still unconscious, amused himself with me in all sorts of ways. Once when he was kissing me and roughly under my arms, I was startled awake. He dropped his glasses on me. My eyes opened the instant I felt their chilly touch. All my clothes had been stripped off and I was lying on my back, stark naked, exposed to the glare of the light. There were two lamps, the floor lamp and another, a fluorescent one, on the bedside table. And so it goes on. Um, so this is a novel in a way about the fact that a husband and wife can't talk to each other about their desires and the way that they do communicate with each other through um, their diaries and they slowly reveal aspects of each of themselves to the other um, with their diary entries. So by the way, that novel, which is called The Key, has also been made into films three times. Once, 1959, it was called Odd Obsession. Then in 1983, it was The Key, directed by Tinto Brass. Sorry, Odd, Obses Odd Obsession was directed by Kon Ichikawa. And in 2014, it was also remade uh, and called The Key, directed by Jeffrey Levi. I actually haven't seen any of them, but uh, it is a fantastic novel. And going back to the debate between novels and films, Colleen says that she did like the movie. Um, maybe, Colleen, you need to go back and read the book again now um, that you've had a bit of a gap of seeing the film and you can read the book again with fresh eyes. If you have anyone to read it with, read it to, that would be a lovely thing. It is a really great book to read aloud or you could listen to it on audio because that is also a really great thing to do um, with The Secret Garden. Particularly, it's a brilliant book on audio. So what to do if you are locked out of your house because you've lost your key? Obviously, you should always keep a book in your garden shed for just such occasions, so that while you're waiting for the locksmith, or for a relative or neighbour to come and rescue you with a key, 
ha keep a couple of books somewhere accessible if you've got a garden shed or wrapped up in plastic under a flower pot. You've got to always be prepared for these eventualities. You can't rely on your phone. It might run out of batteries. You should always plant books in a few places outside your house just in case you get locked out or obviously have one in your bag with you. But if you are currently locked out and need a book to read um, when you've been locked out, I would very strongly recommend Pig Iron by Benjamin Myers as your go-to book to read when you're stuck um, locked out of your house because it's a brilliant novel. Benjamin Myers, we love him, he wrote The Offing which would also be a great one to read to be honest when you're locked out because that one is also very much about the great outdoors and the joys of being outside which you obviously are when you're locked out of your house. Um, the Offing is about a young man who goes off travelling just after the Second World War. He's 16, he knows that he's going to go and work in a mine, he doesn't have major prospects and he goes off on a walk on an adventure and he meets uh, a lady in her mid-40s who's a poet and she tells him all about poetry and his life has changed and it is a, that The Offing is a really brilliant book which I'd recommend to everyone. Pig Iron um, which I've only just read is another fantastic novel which is about a man who is a traveller he's called John John and he went to prison for a reason that I won't go into because you need to read the book and I don't want to give you spoilers and he's just come out of prison he's been part of his uh, parole is that he's he's told that he's got to go and live in a flat even though he really doesn't want to because he's a traveler so he starts a new life he's trying to be really good and trying to just stick to the straight and narrow and do what he has to do and get on with his life and he becomes an ice cream seller and this is all about him John John he is 19 and he's had a very tough life and it keeps giving you flashbacks to his life before he went to prison we know that his dad was probably the most famous, scary and well-known boxer of the travellers and that there's a hint that John John could live up to his father's reputation and skills. But what is brilliant about this book and the reason that I am recommending it to you today as your book for if you're locked out of your house is there's an absolutely fabulous description of the Green Cathedral in the book which is a place that John John goes in order to escape from reality or in order to escape from 21st century reality. Uh, it's set just when mobile, mobile phones were, were coming in. So he comes out of prison and he's never used a mobile phone before, but everyone else is suddenly using them. So it's a bit of a strange new world that he's come back to. And he goes to this place, the Green Cathedral, um, as a place to escape. Uh, it's all set up in Yorkshire near Hebden Bridge. And I really want to go to that Green Cathedral, wherever it is, whether it's real or fictional, I feel it's out there. And in fact, there is a Green Cathedral, just like the one he described, near where I live. And I went there this morning among the wild garlic and it was absolutely beautiful but the reason why it's so gorgeous and compelling is because Myers describes the um, overarching beauty of the green which forms a roof over his head and he feels completely protected and miles away from roads, miles away from people when he goes there and he talks about how being in nature you feel as if every moment a bird is speaking to you or a blade of grass is speaking to you or a 
bug is talking to you. You can watch it like telly all day long. And he, John John, has an amazing poetic soul. And it is a very beautiful and inspiring image, which makes you want to continue to be outside, even when you've been locked out of your house. So I wonder what book you would turn to and what book you might keep in your garden shed. I think it's a very important thing to think about and to consider what would that book be. Um, so do let me know. I'd love to know what your book that you'd keep in your shed would be. Maybe it should be short stories. Uh, maybe it should be poetry. Um, it's going to be different for everyone. But I think Benjamin Myers is your man to keep in the in the shed and to get hold of that book whenever you're locked out of the house or just obviously generally. And he's also just written an amazing book called Cuddy, which um, I've just begun to read and which I know is going to be amazing. So check out Benjamin Myers. I know that you're going to love him. On that merry note, I'm going to come to an end for the evening. I'd love to know if I've missed out some really important key books. I bet I have books relating to keys, books relating to keyholes, uh, going through the keyhole. I'd love to know your favourites. So do tell me if you've got any which come to mind. Um, and I will see you next week. Next week I will be on Damien Barr's Literary Salon. Uh, Facebook and Instagram page. So join me there same time next week. Have a lovely night and thanks for joining me. Good night.